Okay, so we're the Adaptive Game Math Library team. I'm Matt. I'm Terrell. And I'm Mike. So you might ask yourself, what is um, the Adaptive Game Math Library, or HTML? The Adaptive Game Math Library is a set of math routines and functions designed to speed up the process of creating a video game. It's adaptive because we're using self-modifying code to implement um, optimized versions of functions based on the processor architecture. Um, so, progress so far. We've made a new code organization and streamlined the API. Um, most recently we've been working on the tool channel lot. Uh, the green things are things that are completely implemented. The yellow things are things that are partially implemented and we're working on them. And red things are still to come. Uh, so to give you an idea, we have the three major sections of the code, the compatibility layers and non-user facing code. Um, which we really build the API off of. Um, the tool chain, which is pretty critical for us, making sure everything works properly and making sure that our optimizations are actually making it faster. Um, and the user-facing API. Um, and you can just take a quick glance and see what kind of stuff we have. Um, most importantly, uh, most, most important here are the matrix and vector implementations because most graphics related game math is done in 4x4 four four, um, matrices of 32-bit uh, floats. Um, so we have a lot of specializations there to make sure it runs really fast. Alright, so since the last time we presented there's been some new functionality that's been, uh, been developed. Now I'll start off with the things that have actually been completed. As you can see, the matrix and vector implementations, uh, if anybody here is familiar with the, uh, the industry standard BLAST for linear algebra, BLAST 1, which is vector vector operations, BLAST 2, which is vector matrix operations, and BLAST 3, which are matrix matrix operations, are completely done. Um, as Matt was saying, most game math is done with 4x4 four four matrices of 32-bit single position floating point, because that's what the GPU expects. So we actually have a template specialization of that, so it's very efficient. I believe, what is it, four SIMD instructions it takes to fill one of those in? Yeah as opposed to 16 that it would normally take. Uh, so that's sort of a nice level performance went right off the bat. Uh, complex types are implemented with, uh, with the arithmetic that you'd expect on them. You know, you can take complex conjugates and things of that effect. And we have a universal SIMD type, which will, uh, will allow us to do SIMD operations for any sort of uh, data and generally make uh, optimization later a lot easier. Now we've got other things that are still sort of in the pipeline. Now the first one is sort of bulk operations here. That's heavy in development. Um, approximations of expensive functions, you know, trig things especially. Um, we've done a little bit of work on that, but it's still got to come. Uh, allocators we're still working on. If you're familiar with SDL allocators, you know that that can be kind of a bear to tackle, but you know, it's, it's plugging along. Uh, probability functions, we've started reasonably recently. We actually have a, a really, really fast random number generator. Um, it has a uh, periodicity of 256, but for something that's good, you know, if you're just generating random weather or whatever, that's fine. You know, you're not generating, you're not relying on, you know, cryptographically secure randomness here. And uh, and also dynamic vectors, we've come pretty far along with, but uh, but they still aren't done. You might ask, you know, why aren't you just using SDL vectors? Well, these don't cart along a V table with them, so they take a lot less space and memory. And uh, oh, and they're also aligned at 128 bit boundaries, which uh, which makes it a lot more convenient to do SIMD operations on them and things like that. So random numbers with the PRC of 256 then you shouldn't say that you're from RPI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that have to be proved, that has to be at least. I thought you were going to say 2 to the power of 256, <laughs> then it's okay. You, you should read uh, the growth volume to semi-numerical angles, or I can give you some references to that. Okay, so 256 don't even say that. <laughs> that's not a random number, that's a deterministic number. <laughs> so um, when we're implementing, um, functionality that's obviously supposed to be optimized, we need to make sure we're actually working towards an optimized state. So I've been working on a timing framework. I actually have it running on here so I can show you a demo of it. So when you open it, you can put in functions. Right here, I'm standard C at hello world. It's the first function, and then A equals A times B is the second function that's being tested. These could be a call to a function in a header file that's So um, I have A and B set as integers, and 
initialize to value. IO stream is already included. And then after the test is run to prevent the compiler from optimizing it out, essentially, um, you have to output variables being used. You don't actually see this. It's just to check the compiler into. So this is the actual benchmark screen. You can um, run any of these tests on it, up to six of them. However, you can't necessarily run six at a time because some of them um, use the same registers as other ones. And currently, it supports both um, Core 2 Duo systems and i5 up i7 systems. And yeah. uh, it supports a lot of um, tests. Ones that are going to be useful to us mostly are the core clock cycles, instructions, mispredicted branches to some extent, and cache instances to some extent, which you can't see because you can't scroll all the the benchmark. Right. Is it done in the usual C++ framework, or is it, does it run in G, G++? Um, this is Visual Studio. Um, the, the whole um, GUI is actually done in Visual Basic, and it launches various um, components written in C++ and assembly. So now when you see the results, it gives them to you in um, comma-separated value format, which is convenient if you're going to be importing it into like, a spreadsheet. It also has an um, built-in table, so you can view the results of a function like Hello World here, and it'll give you um, a nice table. It actually supports copying and pasting it directly out into a spreadsheet as well. Um, and then obviously it logs compiler output and any errors that might have occurred while building it. So it's designed to be um, usable well beyond <coughs> the scope of what we need for our project, but yeah, very versatile. Okay, uh, we've been working a lot on the performance of our library, um, and we've been doing this mainly by taking uh, common tasks and making very specific functions to do them, because the more information we know about what it needs to be done, the more highly optimized version we can make. This is just to give you an idea of what we've been doing. Up here is a version of a matrix rotation function from someone else's open source math library, and all it does is Create a, uh, creates a temporary matrix, creates a rotation matrix to fill that, then does a matrix multiplication and deletes the temporary. Here is our version, which integrates um, all of the math for creating a rotation matrix and the math for, um, and actually optimized math for um, doing the multiplication on your general matrix. And the way we do it, it saturates both the normal execution pipeline and the SSE pipeline. So this takes about the same amount of time as just generating the rotation matrix in the first example, and less time than the generic matrix multiplication up there. Um, so just to give you an idea of the kind of stuff we've been doing. All right, now uh, as you saw from that code, might at first glance look a bit complex. So one of the nice things to have when you're dealing with things where some sort of, where you're making a trade-off, where you're trading a little bit of complexity to get better performance, is to have a testing framework so that you can uh, be you know, more or less sure when you're changing something that you haven't broken other things. Um, we've got one that's actually relatively mature. It's based on a C implementation of the, uh, of the TAP testing library, if anybody's familiar with that, test anything protocol. Um, it's integrated into the build system. We have some automation. Uh, the make file has a fake make target. Called, uh, called test that runs all the tests, so you can very easily you know, rebuild the project, then rerun all the tests, make sure you didn't blow anything up. Um, we've got relatively, relatively solid coverage. Um, all the blast stuff is covered, which is sort of the, uh, the core of the library, which was sort of the, you know, goal number one. Uh, coverage for complex numbers is coming up, and coverage for other things is, is moving along as, uh, as development con continues apace. Um, so yeah, pretty much the framework itself is nailed down, and we're expanding coverage as we are, but we have the, uh, the core covered pretty well. What is left is a dashboard which tells you what tests are covered, whenever you have that. So that is for the, the kitware uses something like the C dash and C, C tests and so on. So if you can develop a dashboard, that would be good, or you can use an existing dashboard. Okay. okay. Um, to make things uh, compile and run properly for um, 
build targets that don't support all of the um, all of the intrinsic functions that we use. The, the intrinsic functions are compiler defined um, things that directly correspond to assembly code. And the intrinsic we're using uh, correspond to higher level uh, instruction sets that aren't on all computers. So to make that work, we're making an intrinsic framework which takes inline assembly and C implementations for non-conforming environments, the actual intrinsic support for the compiler, um, and I'll get to the last bit of the moment. Uh, makes some compile time decisions to see what your build target is and what it supports, and create, uh, then provides a generic SIMD execution layer that the rest of the library can use to optimize its code. Now over here uh, is conversions between SIMD architectures, which uh, we're making viable right now. The plan is to implement all of the uh, x86 kind of SIMD instructions using the ARM Neon platform so that we will immediately have all of our optimized code ported to ARM uh, at some time in the future when we actually finish implementing that for Neon. That's a pretty new development. Um, as far as future directions go, we're hoping for an ARM port uh, relatively soon-ish. We do have a device to test it on. <laughs> um, we're working on the bulk matrix uh, containers, which are really important for game operations. Uh, and we need some examples and tutorials so that people can actually pick up our library and start using it. So thanks, everyone, for sitting through our talk. Thanks.